Holy Spirit, touch my lips, open our hearts, and transform our lives. Amen. When I was seven years old, I had two starkly different experiences of Jesus. One put me in the center of an institution and taught me to worship rituals. The other showed me through example what it felt like to be held and loved by God. My second grade class in Washington, DC, walked up the hill each week to the National Cathedral to worship in the children's chapel. We kneeled on the cold flagstone floor and were told when to pray, sit, or sing. Little boys sometimes were invited to read, but not the girls. In class, our teacher taught us that the little baby Jesus loved children who kept their voices down, which I certainly didn't. She asked me if I loved Jesus. I said I didn't know, and out of fear, I began to cry. God in my child's mind was the cold chapel, the stern instructions to pray, and a place where I had no voice. Grown-ups told me how lucky I was to worship in the beautiful cathedral every week. But no one showed us children the living heart of Jesus there. I did not feel loved or wanted in chapel, and I had no sense of power or agency. But this was the 60s, and things were beginning to happen in the little byways of the Episcopal Church. On Sundays, our family attended a renegade parish called Grace Church. The priest, whom the children called by his first name, Stu, was experimenting with the liturgy. And during the service, we children ran up and down the aisle of the nave barefoot. When my younger sisters were baptized, I and the other children perched cross-legged around the font. We trailed our fingers in its cool water. I remember that I sat in a patch of warm sunlight coming through one of the fretted windows. Stu told us that Christ, which is another name for Jesus, was the light of the world. He said Jesus was here with us. So while my little sisters were being baptized at the font, I looked around for Jesus. And there Jesus was, I thought, in the body of light coming through the window, holding us squealing children. And I wanted to share my experience with others. I asked you, the priest, if I could baptize Squeaky, my guinea pig. Stu said that was a good idea. And I invited a boy at school to be the godfather. The boy arrived for the service with his mother wearing a jacket and tie. And with all due ceremony, Stu baptized Squeaky. It was a bright Saturday morning and here Jesus was again, holding us around the font. In today's gospel, Jesus is not happy with the way people are worshiping God. Jesus charges into the temple in Jerusalem at Passover and overturns the tables of the money changers. The Message Bible translates money changers as loan sharks, but that's not entirely accurate or fair to the money changers. The money changers were part of a complex system of priests, the sellers of sheep, cattle, and doves used for sacrifice, and many others who supported a cult of temple prayer, ritual, and worship. Any Jew who wished to take part in Passover celebrations needed to navigate the complex system, and no approach to God within the temple system was acceptable without making a bird offering of an animal. Those who traveled far needed to purchase the offering animal at the temple. So here comes Jesus to confront an entire system of religious worship and ritual that has grown up around the temple. The money changers have set up shop in the outer square of the temple called the Court of the Gentiles. And at Passover, when Jesus was visiting, he was joined by hundreds of thousands of Jewish women and men pouring into Jerusalem to commemorate Israel's liberation from Egypt. Temple worship was big business. People purchased hundreds of thousands of animals to sacrifice as burnt offerings all authorized by Caiaphas, the high priest. 
to purchase an animal, a person changed money from Roman coins to Tyrian money. The Roman coins bore the face of the rulers, a form of idol worship, not sanctioned in the temple. And the Tyrian coins were free of this taint. And so the system was well ordered by its own lights. But then Jesus whips away the cattle, upends the tables and banishes the dove merchants because he is furious at the system. Take these things out of here. Stop making my Abba's house a marketplace, he yells. Not so much at the merchants, but ultimately at the priestly hierarchy atop a system that separated an ordinary person from God. The sellers look at him in, stu in a stunned manner because the system Jesus is fighting is invisible. To them, this form of worship is simply a way of doing business. Jesus rejects the idea that worshipers can purchase God's favor with sacrifices. He rejects the prevailing belief that Yahweh is contained by the Holy of Holies of the temple's inner sanctum. He rejects the system and processes of temple worship that, like the golden calf at Mount Sinai, substituted a human monument for the heart of God. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus is speaking of the temple of his body, which will rise from death. The word temple he uses refers to the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of the building where God was, was believed present. But God was not in the temple sanctuary. He says, God is here in Jesus, warmed within his living body. God is not built of a system to be navigated. God is the beating heart of Jesus and of you and of me. Jesus rejects the animals and merchants from the court of Gentiles. He creates a clearing and opens up a space for something transformative to take place. God is not centered in a building. He is found in Jesus. It is Jesus who loves us and atones for our wrongdoings. At St. Margaret's, we have created space for something new too. Jesus has opened up a clearing for something transformative at St. Margaret's. Jesus is speaking to us and we must listen with our hearts. Jesus is in us, in each and every one of us, asking us to step into this clearing with them. Over the next weeks and months, we'll taste Jesus's body again. We'll take part in communion in a new way. Next Sunday at St. Margaret's, we'll worship in a hybrid, spirit, hybrid service. Some of us at home, a few of us broadcasting the service live from the building. For the first time in months, we'll all take part in communion together. Months have gone by since many of us took communion at all. It's been tough. The year of pandemic has demanded rigor and self-sacrifice. As around us, the world and our loved ones continue to suffer. In the midst of this at St. Margaret's, we've discovered ways to flower. Each Sunday, we join dozens of smiling faces in sacred space and time. Zoom worship allows us to hear the word as it is offered, to share prayers instantly in chat, to connect every week to congregants in distant states and countries. And now as people are vaccinated and COVID levels fall, we have an opportunity to see all that is good in what we have done during the pandemic year and remember those things we want to hold on to. And this too will be part of our journey together. Amen.